Don't Worry Darling is out, and it's raised a few eyebrows, that's for sure. The best description would be it's a mix of Brazil, the 1985 movie, Black Swan, and Total Recall hiding in a trench coat made up of 1950s aesthetic. The collection of which may not have been beneficial to Olivia Wilde's sophomore movie as a director. Given the movie has a style over substance approach, small easter eggs and clues can get lost in the shuffle. There's no way to avoid it, so spoilers ahead for the twist. You have been warned. So sink into that chair, because here are 20 things you might have missed in Don't Worry Darling. I'm Joey C. Let's go! It is rather odd that in the 50s utopia that Frank, Chris Pine, created, all the wives take ballet. Stranger still that they would all wind up in the same class with the same instructor, Frank's wife Shelly. The narrative purpose is to have Frank's influence bleed into the life of our protagonist no matter where she is. Ballet being both physically and mentally taxing would leave a high trace on Alice's psyche, but these scenes are very reminiscent to another famous psychological thriller. In fact, I foreshadowed it in the opening. Don't Worry Darling makes use of the same cinematographer as Black Swan. This could explain why the movie makes use of the overhead shot so often. It's not all bad though. When the camera mimics an overhead shot using the miniature of Victory, it has the same eerie feeling as the one in The Shining when Jack looks down at the maze. But watching cars pull out of the driveway just sorta kills the mood. The movie's release is tied with a lot of strife. Flipping through frankly fraught feelings on the film's quality, boy that's a lot of F's, and behind the scenes tension can give a false sense of assurance that this movie was doomed from the start. But that wasn't always the case. This movie is the cinema equivalent of a Greek tragedy, starting high with a story by Dick Van Dyke's grandsons Carrie and Shane, to a screenplay by Katie Silberman. And when Olivia Wilde was attached to direct it, the bidding war started. The movie was by all means going to be a success with 15 to 18 offers, and New Line Cinema won. Only time will tell if they made a good investment. And despite critical reviews, the movie has made a tenth of its budget back in the previews. Beyond monetary gain, how did this bidding war worthy picture turn into a nail biting stalking of public reactions? Let's see if we can find any clues. For context, the MPA is an organization that gives movies their ratings from G to R, and they have a real vendetta against sex in movies. Like, really harsh. No exaggeration, they hate it more than violence. Which is why a movie like I Am Legend, filled with zombie-like creatures, explosions, and gunfire is only PG-13. And The Thomas Crown Affair, 1968, is given the dreaded R rating. Olivia Wilde had a pretty interesting run-in with the big brother of movies when she was forced to cut scenes from the trailer for old DWD, baby. All because the rating board felt they were just too raunchy for advertising. While sex is a factor in this movie, it isn't as important to the story as Olivia Wilde had led it to be. There are very little, if any, direct nudity in the film. Sure, there's revealing shots and simulated acts of passion, of course, but in Olivia Wilde's defense, these scenes are all pretty tame. However, us as audience members are detached from the realities of filmmaking. The best movies can dissolve the borders between what is and what isn't, leaving us with a sense of belonging amongst those we see on screen. If this movie did that for you, that is wonderful, and may you never lose that feeling. But to bring us back down, what this inevitably leaves is us forgetting that these are real people behind the facade of Alice and Jack. Both Florence Pugh and Harry Styles had issues with the movie's most intimate moments. Pugh had an issue with sex being the main focus of the movie, and not to pair it, she feels the movie is bigger than just that. Styles had a more fundamental issue. Despite his popularity and talents with music, Styles is not an actor, so being a relatively fresh face, acting beside the professional pew, made the entire filming of those heated scenes uncomfortable. On that note, we won't get into Styles acting just yet. He is safe for now. We'll instead focus on the thing that made his name in the public eye, music. Listening to the movie's soundtrack closely can tell you things about the characters and their motives. Or, it can spoil the ending just through the genre's built-in motifs. In the movie, Alice's mind meanders from task to task as she hums a horrifically catchy tune. This tune is from her real life, which we learn later on in the movie. In the reality beyond the movie, Pew and Styles work together to make With You All the Time, a catchy clue as to the abuse of reality that Alice lives. It was also apparently completely composed by Styles in just under five minutes, joining the ranks of quick turnarounds in movie history. Okay, time to address the elephant in the room. Harry Styles is not an actor. He's quite attractive, and he's extremely talented. 
but very few casting directors would jump to the conclusion to cast a pop star rather than an actor. So, it should be no surprise that he was not the first choice. Originally, we would have seen Shia LaBeouf as the controlling husband, and this is the start of a lot of drama. The events go as such. According to Wilde, there were some creative differences between LaBeouf and herself that led to an ultimatum. See the interview Olivia Wilde did with Stephen Colbert. What happened between Pew and Shia? It's unfortunately unclear. Whatever the reason, he is replaced with the hot-faced Harry Styles. And the movie is definitely different because of it. If you are a fan of gossip and reporters following strings connected to thumbtacks with photos on a cork board, then this may be a topic to dig a little deeper into. For those who have made the long trek along the gossip roads will inevitably find themselves uncovering odd casting choices in retrospect. Olivia Wilde was originally planning on portraying the main character herself. So what changed? Well, what happened is Midsummer happened, and that made the director fall in love with the endlessly talented Pew, and that's why she was chosen for Alice. If it had not been her acting chops, scenes with the rather wooden Styles would suffer immensely. Not that the chemistry of Pew and Styles isn't apparent off screen, allegedly. For example, about halfway through the movie, Alice is begging Jack to realize that Margaret had tried to unalive herself. Pew's performance plays a pivotal role here. The slow boil of her character is such an important part of the puzzle that without her, the movie would feel even more incomplete. But don't you worry. If you are a rabid Wild fan, then you will get your fill with her casted as the best friend, Bunny. Important yet, on the sideline, Bunny acts almost like the director of the wives, with Shelly taking a producer role. Hear me out. Bunny is the only wife involved who knows the horrifying truth of what is being done to the women of Victory, slipping into sweet serenity with the reality of her children being met by the Victory Project. Whereas Shelly is more of a mystery, it's a weird loose end the movie doesn't address. How aware was Shelly, and how responsible was she for the robbing of these women's autonomy? Anyways, like a producer, she is directly responsible for the production of the women's lives and attitudes. The head matriarch acting through the guise of social pressure and dance lessons. Bunny doing double work as director on and off screen leading the women into the roles their abusive partners have planned for them. When Peg is starting to question what the men do at work, Bunny shuts it down and redirects it to another topic. When Margaret acts out, she stops anyone from being empathetic to her, going almost as far as to blame her for her own son's disappearance. The roles and rules for the women come from Shelley. Bunny is the potter who molds them, baby. The statement this movie is style over substance is more than just a clever pun at Harry Styles' expense. We see the production mini-max into the style of the 50s in every scene. A great example would be the recreation of famed photographer Slim Aaron's poolside gossip. Alice and Bunny gaze at the public pool and its goers, a wonderfully costumed and designed scene that oozes with the 50s, but it doesn't really say anything beyond that. This scene could take place anywhere in Victory. Beyond the aesthetic appeal, the pool is simply a backdrop to Alice having a flashing memory to reality and the question of where the song she's humming came from. The actors, set design, costuming, and even the cinematography is outstanding, but it takes away from the overall story as a distraction with little reason. And let's be honest, if this was a real public pool, Marco Polo would be yelled about every five seconds and there'd be at least three band-aids floating on top of the water. That should have been the first clue that this wasn't real. Let us leave the world of reality. Join me in the world of fiction. What surrealism this movie attempts is not lost on the audience, though we may have looked over the biggest hints this world wasn't what it seems from the get-go. Alice being our heroine starts this journey into the proverbial rabbit hole with a conversation with a bunny. It is far from a stretch to see the connection to Alice in Wonderland, where the titular character starts her adventure chasing a rabbit. The differences start with the actual stories being told, but it is still a nice connection to the original dreamlike reality, though they never explain just how the V VR technology works in the movie, it is safe to assume that it is less real than that of Wonderland. It is unfortunate that our Alice forgets to take Jefferson Airplane's advice when chasing rabbits. Televisions and film rarely show any real media, opting instead to play a fake show or news broadcast. But Alice seems to have a genuine love for 20s animation, because if it isn't a Project Victory propaganda channel, she is watching The Skeleton Dance, a musical animation released in 1929 by Disney as a silly symphony. An odd choice, but we'll rationalize it. Could this be a clue to the underlying eerie nature of the film? Or maybe the skeleton swaying about in a perfect synchrony is a 
a further bleeding through of the dancing that Alice is being forced to watch strapped to her bed, a window her mind is making into the outside world. This also could be a nice way to explain why all women do ballet, even when pregnant. If you are unconsciously watching women dance in unison and are being fed non-stop propaganda regarding order over chaos, then maybe wanting the dance ballet just emerges naturally. Alice and Jack live at the end of a cul-de-sac. Placing Alice in a suburban equivalent of a dead end in a hedge maze was a great idea. She and her friends are by all means trapped and separated from the outside world that 100% exists. The only way they get around is with their husbands or on the trolley. A nice way to isolate Alice without trapping her in a room. It also works with the overall design of Victory. More on that later. She and the rest of the cast inhabit the outer edge of Victory, pushing her even farther away from those trapped with her. Jim Carrey was in an underrated movie in 1998, The Truman Show. One of the biggest ways Truman was kept in the reality of Sea Haven was the constant reinforcement of Sea Haven being voted the best place to live. You're probably asking yourself, what does this have to do with Victory? Well, Victory uses the same tactic, though you probably missed it. The newspaper Alice uses to clean the window, which probably isn't the best thing to use by the way, is hard to read, but you can almost make out that Victory has won some sort of title. It's safe to say it's probably more pro-Victory propaganda. It's odd she uses the same one over and over again, and there is probably some thematic consequence to Alice wiping with Victory. But this small prop is a nice point to flesh out the reality that is begging for breathing room. Dolly zooms are a camera motion that are used sparingly because of how intense they are. Adding a dolly moving from or to an object of a shot to the zooming in or out from that object. There is a shot like this in DWD, but it's done with a steady cam and no zoom. The famous shot of Alice being crushed by the wall of pictures is replicating the look and feel of a dolly zoom. The fact that it is done practically gives the cinematography a nice depth. We are led to believe throughout the movie that Alice's experiences are real but ignored by others. Watching the flick, it is important to pay attention to costuming and set design. Remember that every aspect of the movie is a choice by someone for some reason. So it's an interesting choice that Victory is set up in a near spiral, or that the dress Alice wears has little spirals on it, or the mystery building that Alice finds in the desert on top of the hill has a spiraling road leading to it. Could the continued pressure of the spiral and circling patterns be a nod to Alice's hypnotism? If that can be called hypnosis. Her existence in the false world of victory is brought through the torturous robbing of her own mind or we're seeing a face on the moon only a director's commentary can solve our conspiracies throughout the entire movie alice is in reality strapped to her bed having images beamed into her mind her love jack robs her of her life to give her a reality where she can be the submissive housewife plaything for him and not have to worry about her stressful job helping others. Jack is far from a good person, or significant other. The canopy he uses to brainwash Alice looks a lot like the mirrored facility that brings you back into the real world. It also furthers the connection when both are shot in the same way. We only see the outside of the bed that makes up Alice's entire world once, and it's not even a very long shot, but in it the bed is framed exactly like the building in Victory is. Moving right along, we have a party to get to, and Jack will get mad if we miss his big musical number. The superficial promotion of Jack is a staple point for Alice marking her descent into the truth of her reality, but unfortunately, we are leaving her focus for now. Even though knowing Bunny is aware of what's happening to Alice and is still gaslighting her is very chilling. But this night is supposed to be about Jack. We'll give him his moment, damn it. Harry Styles shocked the cast and crew with his bold improvisation during the weird chanting scene. Bar the words like a cocked up Wall Street yuppie in the 80s. A high energy tension shot is exactly what this movie needed. Did you notice how unnatural Jack dances in the scene? Half tap dancing and holding himself up like a puppet. This could be a clue that he is just a puppet to Frank and Victory. Let's stay on Jack to round out this list. He has a poster on the wall in the flashback that is from Russia with Love, a James Bond movie if you didn't know. So here comes the depth that's missing in Styles' performance throughout the movie. Jack is a fan of James Bond, to the point where he chooses to be British in victory and chooses an Aston Martin to bring Alice home. An interesting tie-in, because the older James Bond movies are far from a fair representation of women. So having the isolated Jack idolize the old school ideas James Bond depicts of gender politics is a great idea. His misogynistic need to control Alice's life in a way he sees fit can be an extension of the dated ideas 
styles of men and women, but the casting of styles pries failure from the jaws of victory, pun intended. He doesn't follow this through line, coming across as naive and faithful to Frank rather than controlling and an active agent in Alice's deceit. Okay, two quick ones for fun because that was a little unsettling. Did you notice how Violet always wears purple? Was this intentional or just a fun way to dress a character? And finally, Frank never actually denied Alice's accusations at dinner. He says he hopes people don't feel trapped instead of telling them that they aren't. Ladies and gentlemen and everybody else in between, you made it to the end of the video. What did you think of DWD? Did we notice anything that you didn't? If so, let us know in the comments below. And as always, everybody, thank you so much for watching.